Hello everyone and welcome to our June 2015 webinar, Checklist for Improving Evaluation Practice. This webinar is an extended version of the American Evaluation Association Coffee Break webinar that Lori presented on April 23rd of this year. This webinar will last 45 minutes. I am Emma Perk and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. With me here at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan is Lori Wingate, the Director of Evaluate. Also joining us today is Goldie McDonald from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For those of you who do not know, Evaluate is the Evaluation Resource Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. Please note the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation or the CDC. We'd also like to acknowledge the behind-the-scenes contribution of Mike Lezecki and Janet Pinhorn at Maytech Networks. The slides and handout from today's webinar are available on our website. This webinar is being recorded and we'll email you the link for the recording when it's available, which commonly takes one to two days. Now we'll take a few moments to learn about Blackboard. If you have ever participated in a webinar that uses Blackboard, please raise your hand. Okay, it's clear by the number of hands raised that many of you may already be familiar with Blackboard functions, but for those of you who are new to our webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you will see on the far left of your screen. Notice the hand icon here. To raise your hand, just click on that icon. It's right above the participants box. You'll also notice the participants box on the left side of the screen. This box lists everyone who's attending this webinar. If you have any questions or comments during today's webinar, you can type them in the chat box, which is below the participants box, and we will address them during the question and answer breaks. Let's practice using the chat box now. Please type the name of the organization you are from and how many people are viewing this webinar in the room with you. So you can go ahead and chat, put that in the chat box located on your far left. Okay, like Mike said, we've got a lot of people in from all over the country. I see people from CDC. Wow, fleet. Okay, great. Well, it looks like you certainly have a hang of that. One quick side note, if you are viewing the recording of this webinar, you're not going to see that chat box. We will also be using the marker tool today. The marker tool may be accessed by clicking on the marker pen icon to the rest, let, right of the participants box. Your cursor will change and you'll be able to write on the screen. So let's try that now. On this map, indicate your location using the marker tool. If you are joining us from outside of the United States, mark on the coast in the direction of your location. Okay, we got some people from Florida, Texas, Arizona, Indiana. Okay, looks like we know how to use the marker tool. So it appears we all have a hang of Blackboard, so I'm just going to cover what today's webinar is on. Lori will be going over two main topics today. First, she'll review checklist form and functions. Then she'll discuss using checklists to improve evaluation practice. Goldie will then share her comments after each section, and we'll also have two question breaks. Now we'll turn things over to Lori. Lori? Well, thanks, Emma, and welcome, everybody. Um, so the core function of any checklist is to help us remember what we need to do. And here's a photo of the, check, I mean, a photo of the checklist that keeps my life in order. So, and I'm guessing you guys have a lot of different versions of this. Maybe you use an app on your phone or you're old school and you have sticky notes all around your computer monitor. We just ha all have so many different roles and responsibilities and things we need to take care of. It's pretty much impossible to keep track of all of those things if we rely on our memory alone. So just getting it on paper and outside of our heads is a way to reduce that cognitive load, the stuff we have to maintain in our working memory. So checklists help me get through the day, but there's a lot more to checklists than simple to-do lists, which are really useful, but it's just scratching the surface when it comes to the power of checklists. So a tool Gawande brilliantly illustrates the power of checklist for improving safety and quality in his book, The Checklist Manifesto, which you can see here is my, one of my favorite books. I have it on my shelf. Um, how many of you have read this book? Just raise your hands. I'd like to get a sense if there's some familiarity with this book. I know at least two of you have read it, so don't be shy. 
Okay, so we're getting a handful a handful of folks. It's a great book. So if you if you haven't uh, check it out, read it. Uh, you can even just Google um, the title, and you'll come up with lots of videos online. Definitely worth a look. Checklists are used in all levels of the aviation industry to ensure flight safety. They're used in construction, and more recently, they're making their way into healthcare. As is talked about in this book, Atul Gawande is a physician. He's a Harvard professor, advisor to the World Health Organization patient safety expert, and in this book he wrote, we need a different strategy for overcoming failure that builds on experience and takes advantage of the knowledge people have, but somehow also makes up for our inevitable human inadequacies. And there is such a strategy, though it will seem almost ridiculous in its simplicity, maybe even crazy to those who have spent years carefully developing ever more advanced skills and technology. It is a checklist, end quote. The surgical safety checklist that Gwande helped develop figures prominently in his book. He has a lot of evidence that even highly trained and experienced surgeons forget fundamental steps in surgery, and those oversights put patients in real danger, even leading to death. And research has shown that using this very checklist shown here on the screen, it's just one page, um, dramatically increases patient safety and well-being in the hospitals where it's been used. So if this one page, 24 point checklist can actually save lives, what can checklists do for our evaluation practice? Before we get into specific evaluation checklists, I want to spend a few moments to provide a foundation for understanding the form and function of checklists, the main types of checklists and their purposes, which brings us to this you know, first main part of this webinar that Emma mentioned. So there's four main types of checklists, and these categories are based on the work of Michael Scriven, particularly his paper, The Logic and Methodology of Checklists, which you can download um, from our website, and it's at this link here. See if I can get my little highlighter there. All right. Use a hand down at the bottom right of the screen. Um, and it's also on the handout that Emma mentioned, which you can download from our website. So the common denominator of all checklists is that they serve as memory aids so we don't forget important items or considerations. And all of these types of checklists, except the laundry type checklist, helps guide users through a particular task or process. And diagnostic and criteria of merit checklists both support decision making, but it's only the criteria of merit checklist that directly supports evaluation conclusions. Um, and I'm going to show you examples of each type of checklist. So the laundry list is a checklist in its simplest form, a non-ordered list of items or tasks, and they may sometimes be grouped into categories. An example of a laundry list kind of checklist is the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Emergency Supply List, which looks like this. And I'm going to zoom in so you can take a closer look in just a second. But what I'm going to ask you to get your markers, and you're going to highlight any items that you wouldn't have thought of on your own on this list. So just take a moment to glance through here and what looks like maybe surprised you or you wouldn't, wouldn't have thought it if, if you had to do this yourself. Yeah, so there's a few surprises for everybody, right? Um, I definitely would not have thought of a whistle or plastic sheeting, for example. And a lot of us make our own laundry t list type checklist, grocery list, packing list. And this one was developed by experts, and we can rely on it to make sure we don't omit, omit important items that we might need in emergencies, just things we wouldn't thought of. And here's the second page of additional items that they say you may need, depending on your location or other special considerations. A procedural checklist is a list of things that should be addressed in a particular order. And because of that, Scriven called these sequential checklists. But it, it's not so much about the sequencing in my mind. It, these are really about pro following a process to complete a task. And the surgical safety checklist that I mentioned earlier is a prime example of a procedural checklist. It highlights key steps that a surgical team should do, and it has broken down into three Three major, um, three major steps before the induction of anesthesia, before skin incision, and before the patient leaves the operating room. So with this easy to follow checklist, now anyone can do surgery. Isn't this great? You love this? No, of course. That, I'm being ridiculous. Of course not. This purpose of this checklist isn't to instruct novices on how to perform surgery. 
It's to serve as a job aid for experienced surgical teams to make sure they don't overlook critical steps that can put a patient's life in danger. And Gwande's book is chock full of examples of how these very common and simple oversights in surgery, even by very experienced surgeons, these happen all the time. And checklists can serve the same function in evaluation practice, and we're going to just get to that in the second part of the webinar. A diagnostic checklist is a tool that helps the user to reach a descriptive conclusion about something. And diagnostic checklists are commonly used in, for screening people for social and behavioral health problems. One example I came across was a, a screening tool for post-traumatic stress disorder. Your auto mechanic may even use a diagnostic checklist to narrow down the causes of a problem your car is having. A component of this Think Ebola checklist is a diagnostic tool, actually. It's comprised of a series of checkpoints to determine if a person is at risk for having an Ebola. And it's, there's pretty, some pretty concrete guidance here for just p placing the patient in one of two categories, at risk or not at risk for Ebola. And while I know we would all agree that having Ebola is bad and not having it is good, the checklist is it's really leading the user to a descriptive conclusion, not one related to quality or excellence, which is what the criteria of merit checklists do, which is our next example. So these kinds of checklists help users to reach a conclusion as well, but in this case it's an explicitly evaluative conclusion, meaning a judgment of merit, worth, or significance. And because a criteria of merit checklist specifies what constitutes quality for a given product or task, these types of checklists are also really useful as job aids to ensure quality while something is being developed. For example, here's a checklist that also happens to be from the CDC. I really love this one, but it's not at all specific to public health. It's a checklist to be utilized by authors, report developers, and other interested parties to aid in the development and maximization of readability of written documents. And using it will help you avoid common pitfalls in academic and technical writing, like this ex excessive wordiness that was in this perfectly awful sentence that I showed you. So I'm going to zoom in here on the guidance for writing clear sentences. And if you scan uh, these checkpoints, you'll see several criteria that this example sentence clearly did not meet. I really like the way this checklist is set up because it, it's, those main checkpoints are all on one page. And then the, there's an additional five page, uh, pages of supporting explanation if people need to know more what's behind each checkpoint. So I kind of think of checklists as sort of the Swiss army knife of professional practice because not only do they serve those main functions that I just reviewed, they also, also bring several other benefits to our work. Uh, checklists are an efficient means of distilling complex content as well as transferring knowledge, experiential and tacit knowledge of experts to broader audiences. And when we use checklists, we make fewer errors. And criteria merit checklists in particular will also in addition to these functions, it kind of helps standardize eva evaluation. Um, but it's these last three benefits that I want to sort of emphasize. So first, we're going to look at an example that distills and presents complex content. So those of you who have funding from the National Science Foundation may have heard of the Common Guidelines for Education, Research, and Development. And these were put forth by NSF and the Institute for Education Sciences. And so how many of you have read this document, this complete document? I have, so I'll raise my hand. Really exciting, riveting reading. So it looks a little, so it's going over 10. So a handful of us. Um, well, it's a lot to take in. So I boiled this 52-page document down into six one- to three-page checklists, one for each of the six types of research outlined in the common guide guidelines. It's much less dense and easier to locate the key points of each type of research. I actually took this one step further and boiled down the content into a one-page graphic overview. And this isn't a checklist. I just like it and wanted to share it. And I think it provides an even more inviting entree to those guidelines. So how do checklists help with quality control? Well, again, that common denominator across all checklists is that they help us remember what we need to do or, or to consider. And quality control is really the whole point of the surgical safety checklist. And we use them here in our work and evaluate for quality control. For example, 
Here's a, just a little snippet from our webinar coordination checklist. We've done over 30 webinars and we, and we have this comprehensive checklist which takes us from deciding on content all the way through post-event follow-up. There's a lot of details to remember in putting on an event like this. And the checklist that we've created based on how we do our work, it helps us keep track of details and helps us produce webinars that are consistently high quality. At least we think so. Checklists are also a good way to transfer experiential, often sort of tacit, um, unexpressed, otherwise unexpressed knowledge held in the minds of experts to the rest of us. And a lot of the checklists on the Evaluation Center site do this. We feature multiple checklists by Michael Scriven, Michael Quinn Patton, Daniel Stuffelbeam, some of the most recognizable names in our field, right? This quote here is from the introduction to the guidelines for developing evaluation checklists by Dan Stuffelbeam, which is a document also available on our site. Um, and it really gets at the essence of what I'm talking about in terms of transferring knowledge from experts to everyday practitioners. So he explains in his early days, when he was really pioneering evaluation, uh, Dr. Stuffelbeam's students wanted to know how he was going about designing program evaluations. And at first he said he wasn't really able to articulate it and realized he had a very internalized way about, of going about his work. So to help his students, he put that knowledge into checklist form. And that checklist ended up being the Evaluation Plans and Operations Checklist, which is on our website along with many others that he's authored. And I encourage you to visit the Evaluation Checklist website after the webinar. Um, many of the checklists we're going to highlight in the second part of the webinar are available on this site. And links for the others that are included in the, web are in the webinar handout, which Emma mentioned. So after the question break, we'll take a closer look at some of the checklists on our site. Um, so, but before we go to the question break, we want to hear from Goldie on her thoughts on the power of checklists. Thanks, Lori. Um, so each of the checklists that Lori shared, I think respond to real tangible problems or what I like to call practice traps. There are these points of professional practice where common but actually quite avoidable errors or even just missteps occurred regularly, whether it was aviation, writing clear sentences, construction, talked about evaluation coming up, or public health. So Gawande's main point in the checklist manifesto was that actually the humble, lowly, not glamorous checklist is truly an elegant answer to avoiding many practice traps in our professional work. So for example, in reference to surgical practice, if you take a close look at that checklist, you can see the practice traps that they're addressing. And one of the very avoidable errors that the WHO surgery checklist addressed was actually wrong site surgery via a simple checkpoint. And it's in the first column and it's marking, marking the surgical site uh, in pre-op. So unfortunately, the checklist isn't used in all hospitals. So when I needed um, surgery for an injured ankle last year, I took it upon myself to do this checkpoint for the doctors um, just in case they weren't using the checklist. Um, so that's my foot, but not the one that would have surgery. Well, thanks for sharing, Lori, Goldie and Lori. Um, this brings us to our first question and answer break. If you have any questions, type them in the chat box and we'll go ahead and address them. Um, Lori, we actually have a question that came through for you. Um, does repeated use of checklists create a lack of concentration? I mean, you just start checking things off without paying attention. That's a good question. Um, and I think if that happens, the checklist clearly isn't being used uh, for its intended function. Um, it isn't being used proper, properly. And the surgical safety checklist, and I think many aviation checklists as well, actually call for a verbal confirmation of each checkpoint. So it isn't just an individual sitting there going, yeah, 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 I did that, I did that. It's actually another person saying, you know, they have to confirm it together. Um, 
that's not the way we're going to be talking about using evaluation checklists. But if you're using a checklist, you you realize that you have a potential for oversight and for error and for not remembering to, you know to you know cross all your T's and dot all your I's. And so you know you should be using it in earnest. So again, I think there is that is a risk, but um, you know it's an incumbent on us if we're going to use these tools to use them for their purpose and and to really pay attention to what the content is. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, does anyone else have any other questions on this first topic before we move on? Or Lori and Goldie, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? I will just jump in because I see a person asking if we can get the recording in. I think you did mention at the beginning the recording will be available in a couple of days. And I see a new question. Yes, up. and as I, yep, we got a few more questions coming up. Um, so one is, checklists tend to deal with tasks in a linear manner, but with this messy nature of tasks, coordination, et cetera, can one frame the checklist to allow for this? Absolutely. And we're, you know, a checklist that we'll show in the next section is the, um, the a checklist that Goldie did, uh, well, two of them both, on indicators and the CDC evaluation framework. And neither of them are intended to be especially linear. Like, you know, look at this, check, we did it, and never look at it again. There's things you have to refer to um, continuously and use iteratively. So some things are very sequential, and if you read Scriven's logic and methodology of checklist paper, he'll talk about certain checklists that are, are very, uh, very sequential and things can't be done, you know, checklists that lower in the um, order can't be done prior to ones earlier. Um, but I think most of those that are intended to guide complex work you know, often need to be revisited. And the surgical example, there's very clear, three very clear time points and when these are done, and those have to be done in order. But I think many checklists can accommodate complexity. So we have a question that came in from Leah, and I'm not sure if either Goldie or Lori wants to take this. Um, do you have any software that assists you with checklists that are complicated? I'm not that fancy. If I'm doing a checklist or using a checklist, it's going to be in a very simple form. So um, maybe if other audience um, members could, if they have examples of that, they could use the chat box to type in what they might use in terms of software. While you're doing that, this is Goldie, and I would say the most valuable help in formatting and thinking about a checklist um, are your colleagues, you know, critical friends who read it from outside your circle and can give you feedback on uh, usability and clarity, um, but they're not in your immediate circle. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, about the critical review there, Goldie, thank you. Um, one final question, are there any tools that you've used that can roll up the details of the list or allow you to unpack more nuanced steps? For example, showing a high level list of tasks for a client and keeping a longer one for internal purposes. I think that's good for Lori. Um, yeah, I think it all depends on how it needs to be used and who needs to do what. I think. It, it's a real challenge to keep a checklist succinct. You start working on it and you kind of want to throw absolutely everything in. And, but to keep it really useful, you kind of need to stay, you know, keep, to stay on the key points and keep it succinct. And his, in his book, Wande talks about their first try at, a, at the surgical checklist and it was way too big. And then they consulted with experts from Boeing and they were really able to pare down to the key points. But I think it's possible to create layered situation where you have a high level checklist and then you, you know, maybe you have supporting ones with key points. I think it really depends on your context and what it needs to be used for. These, th these things have to be usable. And again, I'd reiterate the point about, about having them reviewed by people who are going to actually use them, not just by like, content area experts. Thanks so much, Lori and Goldie, for answering those questions. That actually is going to wrap up our first question and answer break. We're going to go ahead and move on, but keep those questions coming in because we have another one coming up after the next section. Hi, folks. Did you know that Evaluate has several social media channels? We post our new blogs and webinars on Facebook and Twitter, have new resources on Pinterest, and our LinkedIn network is growing. So to find out more about our project, make sure to check out our social media. Also, if you like to tweet, 
then use hashtag evaluation eval checklist to continue this conversation after the webinar. We also want to let you know that the Evaluation Center is seeking a new assistant director. This is a hard funded PhD level position due to a bureaucratic Cratic glitch. The position is currently not listed for external candidates, but if you are interested, please check the link early next week. Now we'll hear from Lori about using checklists to improve evaluation practice. Lori? Okay, thanks Emma and Goldie. Um, we're going to look at some checklists now for use in evaluation practice specifically. There's really quite a lot to choose from and we only have a little bit of time. So again, I would encourage everyone to explore the checklist site on your own. We have 35 checklists organized around these categories. Um, and the checklists submitted to the site and that are published are all are peer reviewed and they usually go through multiple rounds of revisions before they are posted so we can ensure quality. A checklist um, that's widely applicable to all kinds of evaluations is Van Suckelbeam's evaluation contracts checklist. It lists, se it lists several factors that should be considered at the outset of the evaluation. It's nice and succinct, just one page, everything that you see here. Um, when tensions arise between clients and evaluators or different stakeholder groups and evaluators, it's often because of unspoken assumptions. Um, and using this checklist helps surface potential points of disagreement or even just misunderstanding so they can be resolved before the work begins. For example, here's some things to think about with regard to reporting. What are the expectations around the confidentiality of respondents? Will clients be able to review reports before they're finalized? Should there be provisions for rebuttal if clients don't agree with findings? Uh, who has final editorial authority over the report? Is the report disseminated by the evaluator or the client? I'm wondering if any of you have experienced any difficulty around these issues. I find these are these are common um, stumbling blocks in, in evaluator-client relationships or just misunderstandings. In the NSF context, reports go to project PIs, and those PIs, those principal investigators, share the information with other stakeholders at their discretion. But it's some, kind of something you just have to figure out. It's not really specified anywhere. So this checklist doesn't tell you exactly what you're supposed to do, but it does identify several issues that you need to think through when setting up an agreement for an evaluation. It also alerts the user to some factors to consider when budgeting for an evaluation, as you can see here. And these are important issues, but there's actually a lot more to consider when developing budgets for evaluation work. And we actually have another checklist that goes into much greater detail. It's the Evaluation Budget Checklist by Jerry Horn, and it's six pages long with checkpoints across these ten categories uh, with prompts to help the user think through all types of different costs. And the first category here, Basic Considerations, calls for getting clarity on fundamental things like whether the contract will be a fixed price contract or cost reimbursable, as well as um, prompting the user to identify a key contact person in each involved organization uh, who's going to deal with the budgeting matters. And then it walks through these other topic areas um, with questions to make sure you identify all the expenses related to the evaluation. So some of you at the beginning answered our trivia question, not many, but at least one person got it correct that this background photo is from Michael Patton's Utilization of Focused Evaluation book. Um, and how many are you, of you are familiar with this? It's a very popular text. Just raise your hand if, you're, if you know it. A lot of hands popping up. It seems like if no one else has, if someone has read nothing in evaluation ex except maybe one book, this is probably the book. Um, so if you haven't read it to cover to cover, you can, uh, it's long, like I don't even think I've read the entire thing. I look at it a lot, I'm going to a specific uh, chapter depending on the kind of issue I'm grappling with. Um, so Dr. Patton being sympathetic to our limited time and attention span, he's boiled down his approach into a 19 page checklist and he presents that content over 17 steps. I'll give you an example. This step 12 is about simulating the use of findings. And this is something that Dr. Patton recommends for making sure that the data that stakeholders want to collect will actually be useful and actually be used. So he says to make up some findings um, based on the data collection plan, 
and then to guide stakeholders in reviewing this fictional data. And I think that much is probably self-evident in the label of this step itself, simulate use of findings. But what I think is especially valuable in this part of the checklist is that he makes it clear that this activity is for determining if there should be any changes to the plan, the data collection plan, based on how the simulation went, and also that there should be an explicit decision about whether the information that's planned on being collected through the evaluation, that it's going to be sufficiently useful to be worth the cost. So it's really handy to have these key features of the utilization-focused evaluation approach at your fingertips. It doesn't replace reading the book, but it's a nice accessible resource for a quick reference. So Goal D, McDonald, our guest discussant, isn't just a checklist fan. She's actually also an author of two important checklists on the checklist website. And the first one we'll look at is her checklist version of the CDC's framework for program evaluation in public health. So those of you, and there's a lot of you on today, I think, from public health, you, I'm sure you know about this framework. And public health professionals are expected to have some familiarity with the evaluation. But if evaluation isn't your main job, then you just may not be inclined to take the time to read this dense 58-page document. And again, I'll ask, how many of you have read the entire thing from 1999? Just raise your hands. I'm going to watch all the way. Any more? We have eight. I've read it. You can add me to the list. Okay, there's, there's not a lot. There's not a lot of hands going up. Okay. Um, a few more. All right. So Goldie's been evaluating public health programs for a really long time. Well, not that long. I mean, she's not that old, but a fair amount of time. And so she, in that work, she recognized the need for a more accessible, consumable way for busy people, busy practitioners to learn the framework's content. Um, so she distilled this dense document into a very readable eight pages. And she highlights the essential elements of each of the six steps and includes some helpful clarifications and considerations for each step as well. Uh, so I just, as a side note, as well, this framework is developed specifically for evaluating public health programs. It's really quite applicable to almost any evaluation set setting. It's a very um, adaptable approach. So here's the essential elements of step two of the framework, which is to describe the program. And obviously her checklist includes more text than this, but to keep the slide readable, I've just included the label for each uh, checkpoint element. And I find this checklist format to be so much easier to use as a quick reference than the full framework document is. And I actually refer to this checklist a lot now that I'm doing more and more work in public health. So step three of the framework is focused on, uh, it's focused the evaluation design. And on this slide, I've left off the last element. So if you know what I've left out, go ahead and type the answer in your chat box. What's the missing element here? Angela says data analysis. Leah says findings. They're good, important to design. Any other thoughts? Uh, Max says outcomes. Right, it's not really that obvious, is it? Um, it's actually agreements. Agreements are easily overlooked when you're doing the technical work design, but those agreements those can really place constraints on things like timing, access to data, um, importantly, what resources can be brought to bear on the evaluation. So its inclusion here is a cue to the people involved in evaluation design to go back to those things that were determined um, by considering points in, for example, in the evaluation contracting and budgeting checklist. So these checklist checkpoints here you see on the screen collectively, um, these remind us that design isn't just about the data collection. Um, we need to align the technicalities of design with why the evaluation is being done, who needs to use it and how, as well as the questions and the methods and more technical considerations. So on top of, and on top of those, all those considerations, it has to be feasible in relation to these agreements that are in place. And one last thing I want to point out about the CDC evaluation framework checklist is the inclusion of the program evaluation standards. So it's really lie at the heart of this framework. And Goldie has included the standard statements at the end of the checklist, really making the point that they are part and parcel of this framework, which I think a lot of people tend to forget. The other checklist that Goldie has authored 
is um, criteria for selection of high performance indicators. And this is another high performing indicators, excuse me. This is another example of uh, a checklist that really distills expert and experiential knowledge for the benefit of us with maybe less experience. Goldie's worked all over the world with a huge range of uh, groups and different stakeholders and people in different cultures. And this checklist is grounded in that real world practice. The checklist is four pages long and it has 14 points to consider when selecting and developing indicators for use in evaluation. And as you can see here, she really does engage stakeholders directly in using this checklist in her practice. That checklist that I have the arrow showing to you, it's not photoshopped in, it's just a photo of a real working session in Uganda. So one of the checkpoints is labeled non-directional language, which is about the indicator being written in neutral terms, keeping the desired outcome distinct from the data to be collected around that aspect of performance. So let's apply this criterion to an example. So I'm going to ask you to use your markers and circle the indicator that you believe better exemplifies this criterion about the use of non-directional language. And while you're doing that, I'm going to take a sip of water. Right, you're all getting it, right. B is looking only for an increase, and that's a problem because it may well be that the program doesn't produce an increase, or maybe it even leads to a decrease in retention. And so the indicator shouldn't focus on, or should focus on what's to be measured, which is retention, and then the analysis of those data will indicate whether there was an increase, a decrease, or no change, and the can interpret how substantial those changes are. So let's look at another example that's a little more subtle. So again, here's a different example, uh, A or B. You can pick the one that better exemplifies the criterion. Good, you guys are getting the hang of it. So if we were to write the indicator um, as A, percentage of participants who attended 75% or more of events, the thing being measured actually becomes binary. So the participants would be grouped in one of two categories, those that attended 75% of events and those that didn't. So if we did that, we would lose out on a lot of detail and richness in the data, and it would also limit our options for analysis. So bringing these uh, criteria for good indicators to the attention of those involved in designing the evaluation and planning data collection, I think as Goldie will probably talk about is very useful to get everyone on the same page and in agreement about uh, what kind of indicators should be, um, you know, where the resources should go in terms of collecting data around indicators. So enough about me talking about Goldie's work. Let's actually hear from Goldie herself now. Thanks, Lori. Um, so indicators aside, although they are a favorite topic, um, my initial interest in using checklists to improve my evaluation work came from a very, very practical challenge. Um, how can I enable or enhance stakeholder participation in the evaluation in meaningful and productive ways? Like, how do I literally do that? Um, in my case, stakeholders and even many of the people tasked with program evaluation tasks like our work responsible for an evaluation, we're coming to that process or that work with varying levels of knowledge and hands-on experience. I, mean, I think that's something many of us find. So how could we better enable people to participate in this evaluation work when they really didn't share the same level of knowledge or understanding or experience? And for me, on certain tasks, checklists really were the answer. So the checklist content from the Framework for Program Evaluation in Public Health and the Indicators Checklist both take rich technical content and put it in a usable format or job aid that is not relevant just to the evaluator. It's relevant to the stakeholders and other users because with really a limited investment of time, those stakeholders can read and understand the basic content they needed to work with others and apply that content. So 
we see some of that here, that really with just a little bit of investment of time in reviewing the checklist, stakeholders could be prepared to engage in certain tasks as a collective. Um, and not just engage in a silly or frivolous way, but in meaningful dialogue. The second motivation for using checklists and my real passion for them was the idea of bringing to light critical items that are often under discussed or overlooked completely. So just like in the surgical safety checklist with the marking the surgery site, that's an item that can be overlooked with really terrible chain of events to follow. So I don't know if our chain of events is quite as terrible, but if you take a look at the indicator checklist and you see these last couple of items on page four, there are two that are really often under discussed or overlooked completely. So one of them is this notion of the evidence supporting the use of an indicator. Um, really taking the time, this item talks about taking the time to look at the evaluation of similar or the same programs in um, the literature, the, the um, you know, like the scientific and practice literature, that that can be overlooked in the rush to data collection. But it's this critical item that can dramatically improve the quality of an evaluation that uses indicators. The next one that again falls into this idea of um, under discussed or overlooked completely items is the value of an indicator within a set of indicators. So we tend to find people will talk about um, the quality, the value, uh, the characteristics, the feasibility of a, an indicator and go through that conversation. But we don't then place our assessment of that indicator, its, its usefulness, its feasibility in a set of indicators. We tend to think of them as standalone and then in the end we have this set. So this one that's overlooked or underlooked, when done from the outset, can really help us create a package of indicators or set of indicators to answer evaluation questions that works in concert, that really works together, uses resources wisely. That's the same idea with the framework checklist where the standards content in the center of that framework is often under discussed. And so in the checklist, all of the final pages include the rich statements underneath um, the higher level uh, titles of the, stand of the standards. Um, so with that, let me pass this back to Emma and we can have some more conversation. Well, thanks, Lori and Goldie, for sharing that information. This is actually our final question break. Um, so if you have any questions, type them in the chat box. We did have a few that came in. The first is, can we use a checklist as a method of asking an evaluation question? Would checking off items constitute a measure? Lori? Well, that would probably fall under the lines of a, a criteria of merit checklist. So, for example, if we were evaluating this webinar, we might have a list of criteria for what makes a good webinar and somebody could observe and tick, tick, tick it off. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you could have that kind of quality, um, a checklist that, that defines dimensions of quality and use that as part of an evaluation. I would be a little hesitant to have that be the only uh, source of, uh, of data for something as important as an entire evaluation question. Um, but I think it definitely can, can support um, different aspects of evaluation and really articulating what criteria are for quality I think is really important in, in our work. Great, thanks. We've got one more question. What has been done to get PIs and others writing proposals to understand the need to write quality standards based indicators? Lori? Yeah, I saw that and I'm going to actually ask Angelique to email me her question because I'm not ent entirely sure um, that I understand the question and we have one minute to close so I'm not going to fumble around trying to answer what I think she's asking. 
Okay, yeah, and as Lori mentioned, we only have one minute left, so we're actually going to go ahead and move on. Um, we did want to let you know that uh, Valuate does have a weekly blog that features content generated generated by users from around the ATE community. This week's post is by Corey Smith, titled ATE Program Recruitment and Retention Strategies. If you want to read more or contribute, go to our website and select the blog page. Also, don't forget to register for our next webinar, Evaluation Don't Submit Your ATE Proposal Without It. That is scheduled for August 19th at 1 p.m. You can find the link to register on our website in the webinar section. This brings us to the end of our webinar and our time together. Please take a moment to tell us what you think about the webinar. It will help us to tell our future content and to provide you with the best experience we can in the future. We'll leave the survey open. Moderators, remember not to close the survey window on your screen. And while you're working on that, we'd like to thank you for your participation in today's webinar. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Lori and Goldie, thank you for sharing your wisdom. On behalf of all of us here at Evaluate, thank you so much for being with us, and have a great day.